Uh, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is February 25th, 2015, and um, we um, are, very, are very excited tonight to have Renee Watson back on. Um, Renee uh, was on, oh, I don't know, a month or and a half ago or so, talking about uh, some curriculum work she did around Black Lives Matter, and uh, and she and I have uh, talked around Dream Yard and um, with the New York City Writing Project and so forth. And she mentioned that she had a book coming out. And we got very excited about that. So we are here to talk about uh, This Side of Home, a really wonderful young adult novel that Renee has written. Um, but uh, that book is dedicated to Linda Christensen. Um, and uh, Renee, every once in a while, said, you know Linda, too? And uh, so, so you guys can kind of explain your relationship here a little bit, um, and uh, and it's all kind of set around. I think if you, you can correct me, um, certainly Jefferson High School is implied in, uh, and that I think that's where you went to school. Is that yes, I went to Jefferson High School. Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to shut up here pretty fast. So, um, we invited a, an English teacher um, to join us as well from Jefferson. I think you might be involved with the Oregon Writing Project as well. I am. Cool. Um, and he invited some students, and they're coming and going, and we're going to figure that out here a little bit. Renee, do, do you, with that introduction, do you want to start off and introduce the people who are here and and um, and let's let's keep going after that. Um, Marianne um, is from Portland. I'm sorry, you're from Vermont. Is that correct? Yeah. As well. So, Marianne, why don't you introduce yourself, and then we'll get into it. Um, okay, I am um, a high school social studies teacher mm -hmm. in rural Vermont, and um, I have talked to Renee a little bit about how to teach my students about. Um, diversity where there's a place where there's no diversity. So I'm really excited um, to hear her speak tonight and um, also to hear from her students. So that's exciting. Welcome. Renee. Yes. What have you done? You've written a novel. How did you do that? <laughs> um, well, I, I want, first want to say you know, thank you especially to the folks in Portland, which is my hometown. Uh, Thanks for taking the time to talk tonight. Um, you asked a question about is is the book based on Jefferson, and you know, in a way, yes, of course. I wrote about um, Northeast Portland and gentrification that's happened in that neighborhood. Um, so it definitely is a mixture of what's happening now, what happened when I was in school, um, and I dedicated it to Linda because I started writing the book in her English class. So I didn't know, of course, that I was writing a novel way back then. It was a short story that kind of then turned into a play, but I noticed some changes in my community, and uh, I don't know, I just needed to write about it, and the story stayed with me as Portland continued to change, as I moved, then I moved to New York, and Harlem is changing, Brooklyn has changed, so I just felt like, oh, this isn't just about Portland, this is about America, this is about race, this is about class, um, so it became a bigger story for me. So I, Linda is amazing, and um, Andy Kulak is a great teacher who, when I worked in Portland as a teaching artist, um, many of my students had him and loved him, and um, it was, it's an honor to have him here tonight, and I'll let him introduce his students. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, very honored to be here as well. I've got like this delay in the headphones, so I'm going to take those off. Um, so I've been here at Jefferson for 15 years and um, started working with Renee's book for the summer, well, actually last year when, when Linda was talking about it, and immediately excited because I knew it would really resonate in the classroom, and it has. Um, and to attest to that, I've got a couple students who are here and a couple more that might be joining us. Um, so on the screen right now, I think you're all seeing Austin Marcel, who's a sophomore. And uh, Austin, you're currently on chapter 36, is that right? Okay. And he's fresh off the baseball field, coming in with that Portland rain, uh, working out in the batting cage today, so I'm really glad he's, he's here right now. And uh, also on the screen, I see Isaiah Pichon. Isaiah, can you hear us? Thank you. 
His picture's frozen, but Isaiah's a sophomore in my eighth period class, and he's currently broadcasting him from SEI, which is a, um, a community organization that works closely with our school. Um, he had to record some music there and heard about this opportunity and wanted to make sure he was involved. So thank you both for being here. And if other students uh, pop on the screen, I'll make sure I introduce them as well. Very cool. Linda, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit and um, say, you know, how you say some things about the gentrification curriculum and how you know Renee and anything that comes to mind. We're very <laughs> informal here. Sure. Yeah. Um, so my name is Linda Christensen. I'm the director of the Oregon Writing Project now, but I was... So, Linda, could I suggest something? Um, yeah. If you're in the same room and you're not talking, you can mute your um, yourself, and things will. I think things will be better. You'll get yes. There you go. Okay. That'll work. Okay. Go ahead, Linda. Yeah. So, um, as I said, I'm the director of the Oregon Writing Project now, but I was a teacher at Jefferson for most of my 30 years in the classroom, and I continue to work with um, teachers and students at Jefferson. And Renee was one of my delightful students at Jefferson a number of years ago. I also had two of her other sisters. And um, what... Um, and so Renee has sent me copies of her books to give her feedback on as they were in process. And during the time that Renee and I were conversing about her book, I was also um, working on a curriculum around gentrification because one of the things that's happened is that um, the area that Jefferson High School, where Renee went to school, is located is in a highly gentrified area. Um, and it's also the area that I have lived in. And so I put together a unit for language arts and social studies teachers at Jefferson, but that has also been taught at um, schools around the area, um, the landing zone, as they call it, school. So it's about the history of what has happened in Portland, um, how um, the how local government has used rules and laws um, in order to take over businesses and homes in the what was once really the lively, thriving African-American community. And while there's still a lively and thriving African-American community, it is a very gentrified community now. And so what this became, this was part of a year-long unit that Diane Leahy, another language arts teacher, and I put together called Stealing Home, and it was looking at the ways in which black wealth, Latino wealth, Asian wealth has been stolen over the years. And so um, through um, different kinds of means of violence um, or also through laws and ordinances, and in Portland's case, it was really through laws and ordinances called like redlining or um, the exclusionary acts um, as well as um, the um, other kinds of laws. So um, we created a, a history on that and that we co-teach along with, with Renee's book. So when Renee's book was coming out, we thought it was a really great time to pair the two um, activities, both the gentrification unit along with Diane, with Renee's unit. Sorry, Diane is her <laughs> older sister. <laughs> and so um, we are, uh, so we got together this summer, the group of language arts and social studies teacher at the 10th grade um, with Andy Kulak and a number of other teachers, uh, social studies and language arts, and put this unit together, which we are teaching now. And it um, was uh, punctuated delightfully by a uh, visit, school visit, um, from Renee. And so students not only got to read some of her poetry, short stories, as well as, um, as the novel, and got to see her and hear her. And uh, so her legacy continues at Jefferson. <laughs> Austin, can I pull you into this? Uh, you'll have to unmute. Um, you're, I think you said you're on pay, uh, chapter 36, which is what, about halfway through or so, I think? Yeah, uh, Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so what's the, what's the book about? 
Jordan's talking about how it is to grow up in Portland or in the Northeast Portland area and how it was changing throughout the years and how Jeff and everything was just evolving as a community. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as we talk though, I mean, it, I wouldn't want people to think it's a political book because it's very um, personal too. Like, well, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's sort of talking about the uh, personal parts of my life, like how there's, there's expressions and stuff like that that you up in the community. Mm -hmm. I can add that. Um, you know, I, I appreciate you saying that it's not a political book and that there, it's a personal story, right? Because I do think that there's a detachment when people talk about gentrification and other issues that are a part of our society. We tend to be very heady about it and talk about it in theory, but it is personal to lose your neighborhood and to watch it change and to see um, stores come in and, you know, houses get remade and to have a feeling that this isn't for you and to feel like it took white people coming into your neighborhood to make this a better place and so I do think that yes there's a political part but it's definitely about a girl who's trying to come to terms with uh, change in general there's so many things that are changing in her life she's a senior in high school she's been told that you know this is what you're supposed to do you go to college you date this kind of person um, you're this kind of student and then she arrives in her senior year and everything is changing her neighborhood she's fallen in love with someone she didn't think she'd ever fall for her sister's not wanting to go to the same school anymore you know so it's a coming of age story also and definitely the backdrop is the, the, are these issues about race and class and how that affects um, your life uh, even as a teenager well, I love the fact too that um, it's complicated too, and to see Maya especially wrestle with all these different aspects of change that are happening in her life, um, that has been one of the most fun parts to teach. Um, we actually took a little detour um, to capture some snapshots of scenes, and the students in class have really enjoyed finding themselves in this text along with Nikki and Maya and Tony and Kate, uh, Essence, and writing about their own personal stories here in North and Northeast Portland. Um, so you can kind of see on the wall behind Austin, there's a lot of the snapshots that are there. And those will turn into these essays that came from more of the, the um, gentrification and politics underneath that uh, Linda was talking about. But it's the personal, every, like everybody's got so many stories that they're relating to from this book. And you can kind of see my copy with all my little uh, post-it notes of all these great <laughs> tension points that Renee has built in that have just created these great prompts for jumping off. So. Um, it's it's just really great. Like you, you right when you think you you've got a handle on the, a character, there's this this great twist that comes in, and and I love watching kids respond to that as well. Can can you show us one of those post-its? One, one of the post-it post notes. Post -it notes. Yeah. Sure. What are those? So I would um, as I'm reading, I'm just posting things that stand out to me. And then I'll start to think of what's the prompt here that'll generate some student writing that might lead to a bigger essay later after they have time to sit and examine. So this one is about, um, they're talking about this event here called Last Thursday, um, which is complicated in and of itself. Um, but uh, Maya is saying that, that she doesn't want to go there and spend her money in the businesses that have come into the neighborhood. Um, so the prompt is asking students to think about, well, where do they spend their money? Um, where, where don't they spend their money? Where do they go? And, and trying to keep it in a frame of where they make a conscious choice to be a consumer. Um, and it also connects to a bigger economic lesson about um, how they're advertised to and the things that they will throw their money at because they're, they're, they're drawn to it so much. But also in the neighborhood, like one student wrote about her father's business and whatever she has and she can, she likes to go and buy something from there to, to help you know, support his business as well, and, and it talks about that thing. So that's one of them. Great, thank you for that. Yeah. Marianne, jump in whenever you'd like. But um, okay. <laughs> so uh, 
I and and I want this to kind of flow more as we go. Um, I, but I, I wanted to get back to what you wrote in high school. What was that? It was a short story. It was a and short what, story. What was the prompt that gave you that short story? And then uh, you know, so I don't think that it was a it wasn't a prompt, which is what I love. And I've said this to Linda, so I'm not just saying this now. But Linda was the kind of teacher that. Our relationship lived outside of the classroom, so mm -hmm. yes, we had poetry assignments and an essay to write or something for class, but if I wrote something on my own at home, I could also come in and bring that, and she would look at that as well. So this story I was writing while I was a student, but it wasn't necessarily an assignment from her, um, but she taught me in our class how to respond to the world through you know, writing and writing about what we care about. And so when I was a junior in high school, uh, one of the grocery stores in my neighborhood, which was kind of a run-down grocery store, it was that store that, you know, maybe didn't have, wasn't fully stocked and all of that. It was changed into a police precinct. And then it just became like a whole little promenade right there um, on the corner of MLK and Killingsworth. And I didn't have the language. I didn't know what gentrification was. I was a junior in high school. I didn't know what that word meant. But I just felt that that wasn't for us, us being the people, white and black people, who were living in the community already. Um, and then there was like a store that was selling. What kind, of, what kind of store did it become? I, it didn't become a store. It became a police precinct. A and, precinct. Um, yes, I thought you little, said. Other little know. stores and shops, a bookstore and mm -hmm. other I don't know, I think there was a sandwich shop maybe. Um, and then there was a, like an organic grocery store that came into the neighborhood. And again, I just was like trying to process what that meant. So I created these two sisters who are twins. And one of them is really excited about all this change and loves to go to the new coffee shops and loves to explore all the newness. And the other sister is like, well, that's good and all, but... What about us? And what about our friends who can't afford to live here anymore? So it kind of was just an argument. It was a scene. Um, and I would read it in class. Linda would have me come to the younger grades, and I'd share it with them. They'd give me feedback. I'd go back and write. And I, I put it away after I graduated. I never thought, oh, this is going to be a novel one day. Um, and it just stayed with me. It, like I said earlier, it was a story that kept evolving because Portland kept evolving. And I, that one little store or that one little um, addition to the neighborhood 20 years later is now a whole different world. When I go back to Northeast Portland, I don't recognize it anymore because it's so different. And I know that that is not unique to Portland. Um, so yeah, so that's, I mean, part of why I wrote the story too is to put on record. Um, a truth that is sometimes neglected and overlooked. So a lot of times people speak about Oregon and Portland and it, it is about the beauty and there's a lot of beauty in the Pacific Northwest and people speak about the cyclists and <laughs> our you know green way of being but there is some racial tension there that I think um, we don't talk about and so I wanted to write something for young people and for adults to have kind of like a catalyst, a springboard to to be able to talk about these issues and create some safety around that because you're talking about characters maybe first and then your personal story. So that was kind of my inspiration behind writing it and, and taking it from this short piece to a longer piece. Mm -hmm. So I'm thrilled that teachers are using it in the classroom and thinking about ways to connect it to personal stories because I think that's how we create community and continue to heal and build by sharing our personal stories. I agree. Miguel, can you hear us? I saw Miguel pop up there. I just wanted to yeah. check in. Miguel, right. are you there? He's coming. Uh -oh. <laughs> He's working on it. Linda, can you say a little more about why, you know, if, if you're not living in Portland, why would uh, looking at gentrification and or neighborhood change um, be an important thing for both teachers and students to do? Well, I think that no matter where we are, um, whether, I mean, I grew up in a very small town in Northern California, Eureka, California, 
and there are a lot of changes that have happened there. And so I think wherever we are, there we are noticing changes. And um, and so whether we're in Portland, Oregon, we're in Eureka, California, we're in um, New York, um, or we're in Louisiana, we can see that that things are changing around us. And I think that one of the things that um, that Renee's book highlights and that the gentrification unit highlights is that um, that these changes don't just happen arbitrarily. That it's not that there are reasons why these things have happened and that we need to interrogate those reasons and we need to see who's benefiting from the kinds of changes that are happening and who is losing. And so one of the things that triggered this this interest for me was that there was a Pew uh, report that came out in 2009 that said that um, that African Ameri that um, that white Americans had 80 times, 20 times the wealth of African Americans and 18 times the wealth of Latinos, and that's when I started investigating what was happening historically in order to to um, to help us understand those statistics. So it wasn't that African Americans were lazy. It wasn't that they didn't care about their homes or businesses, but that in fact there are processes in that happen like urban renewal where you have a law of eminent domain that allows you to call a certain area of town blighted and then to move into that area new businesses and to take out you know hundreds over 300 homes and businesses in Portland for example in order to build the school district office a freeway and um, a civic auditorium and that it's not it's not a um, it's not peculiar to Portland because it happens it's a pattern of of really neighborhood betrayal that happens across the country and I think what's really important about Renee's novel is that she's able to intersect that and I think what is a blessing about her novel is that she's able to intersect it in a way that captures both sides of the argument that really helps people understand there's a wonderful chapter I think it's 62 where um, Maya is in a coffee shop with um, Mr. Washington and they go through and they talk about the history of gentrification and at the end of the chapter uh, Maya turns to to Mr. Washington and she says what do you think about all of this and clearly she's on Alberta Avenue in Portland Oregon and he said I think that there's some good things that came out of that that out of this we have um, we have sidewalks where they're that are handicapped accessible we have um, new businesses but that what I hope we also have are communities who support each other and so I think what Renee was able to do was to really demonstrate both sides of what has happened what are what are the beneficial effects of gentrification but also what have been the harmful effects and how we need to create a community that's willing to work together to make um, to make life beneficial for both parts of um, of the community. Mm -hmm. Cool. I, Andy, do you want to jump in and and talk a little bit about um, the curriculum? You know, and how like what are the parts of it? So early on, um, we did uh, a tea party. So it, it's kind of framed. We like that word "blessing" is is kind of floating in the room right now. Um, the Oregon Writing Project over the summer uh, pulled together just some brilliant minds to build a lot of really great curriculum that a classroom teacher can then take a look at and say, "Hey, this is perfect for the direction we're going to go." One of the things was a tea party of people affected by. Uh, gentrification that's occurred in this area um, and what was so resonant about it was uh, students recognizing names of people that uh, they didn't know their story before and suddenly that history comes alive in the classroom so I took some great video of kids really getting into character and starting to understand the real stories of people that uh, parks are named after here or just prominent people in the neighborhood um, business owners um, and so from there, then we move into some of the more historical elements. Um, we learn about uh, Vanport and what happened when Vanport flooded. Um, we're going to talk more about um, what Linda was talking about 
in, in terms of the, the corridor where you had the, the um, school district office built and the, um, the I-5 highway. Um, we did a walking tour as a staff at the beginning um, so that all of us were familiar with where we are and the history of where we're working. But in the classroom itself, that kind of set the tone for kids just to get them up and excited about um, what, we're, what we're going to be getting into. Um, I don't know, I, gotta, I don't want to just get long-winded about it. There's some great poetry pieces that we did at first, too, to kind of wet the palette. Um, and again, like the, the prompts lead to some great poetry writing. Uh, we did a narrative, and we're going to build into an essay, so the writing pieces are always at the forefront of how we're collecting the evidence to inform the writing that we're going to do. Um, we've had some great discussions. Um, Fridays we have student-led discussions about things that are coming up um, in the book or things that you're thinking about now that you weren't thinking about before. So those are just some pieces. I don't know um, if there's questions before I go into more or... Yeah, that's cool. I, I, yeah, please jump in. Yeah. So I think what I, what I hope um, teachers are taking away who are listening to this, it's about thinking about your local history and exploring mm -hmm. that with your students. So even, you know, he's in Portland, so he's talking about Portland, but I also teach in the Bronx. And so it's important to me to think about, well, what is the history of the Bronx and how do I get my young people to understand that they're on a continuum and that something happened here before they got here and what is that something and how does that affect what we, where we are now and how we're interacting with each other now and so that so that young people don't feel like um, what is the, that the situation that they're living in is their fault or you know or like it's just happened. No, there's a historical context to what's happening now across our nation and so how do we get young people to explore history and so that whole tea party that um, he's talking about is you know it's like role-playing people are interacting with each other as characters walking through a space and kind of investigating who is this person who is that person and I think that's a powerful way to make history come alive in the classroom and not just be kind of stale um, so we I've used that and, and Linda and Bill Bigelow they're like um, you know, the pioneers of that activity. And I've, we've used it a lot at DreamYard um, with our young people. Cool. So I just wanted to add that in there. That's great. Yeah, it, it reminds me of a couple things. One is, um, I don't know, must be five years ago now, um, Zach Chase and Diana Loffenberg at, um, um, in Philadelphia did a project where they had students adopt buildings um, in their neighborhoods, either close to the school or or um, or close to their home, and then they had to find the history of those buildings, um, mm -hmm. which, was, which was a really interesting project that, that people did as well. But so it's that kind of place-based stuff. And then <laughs> one of my favorite podcasts I wanted to, is uh, Latino USA, and um, they did a whole show where they just sat in a bodega. Um, in, in New York City on 135th Street, and the last five minutes is all about uh, Bodega. Sorry, um, is all about um, how the neighborhood around is changing. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, I it, it there, I think there are wonderful resources around this kind of thing that, that people can work on in, in various ways. That kind of local knowledge. Um, I just want to make sure is uh, no, he's still not there, right? <laughs> Students are trying to get in here, but they're trying. Yeah, it's okay. It's there just good. It's it's it always happens this way. Fine. Um, Marianne, can you represent role for a second? What's that? <laughs> if, represent if you're not in an urban space. What's it yeah. like when you think about neighborhood change? Well, it's actually it's interesting as I've been listening to everyone talk. I I mean I grew up in New Jersey and and lived in Harlem and was actually uh, part of the gentrification process on 118th Street. I think we were the first. Um, we were the uh, yeah. It, it's interesting. I'm thinking when I was in college, um, we couldn't afford to live. <clears throat> near school, which is at 59th Street, so we moved into an apartment on 118th Street, and I kind of landed myself in a situation where I I didn't even think about the social implications of what it would be like to have four college girls living um, in a building where everyone had been living there for you know generations and generations, and um, that was a really powerful experience for me, and I learned a lot. So um, I kind of I'm sad in some ways that my students don't 
I don't I, I don't even think they would understand what gentrification is um, because everyone that lives where they live is trying to leave because it's yeah. a rural community and and every that the dream is to get out of the community and um, there is no diversity so I think but it, you know what I mean and and th this will be a different show but um, and we could gather some writing project folks um, and and others um, who who have looked at rural issues too but yeah. that 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 wanting to leave feels like a similar kind of thing because mm -hmm. there's there's something that that happens when nobody is fishing anymore in a fishing community for example and and so forth so anyway but yeah I think there are local issues around a lot of that. Um, if you are trying to get in here please jump in and say hi any of the students Isaiah Miguel can you hear us oh yeah I can hear you guys Okay, yeah. hi Miguel. Hey. Good. Hi. Introduce yourself, Miguel, and tell us what you've been thinking about. About what the book? Yes. yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, my name is Miguel, and I really think the book is like it really talks about Portland really good. Um, I can relate a lot about how my friend lost his home and moved to Gresham. I mean Salem. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, what else? Are you a just think, tenth grader, Miguel? Uh, yeah, I'm a tenth grader. Yeah. Okay. 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 Miguel, we were talking um, about the snapshots before. Is there one of the snapshot writings that uh, you're thinking about that um, you think you might want to write some more about from class? Uh, maybe the Alberta one about how it changed a lot. I remember I used to go to like this Don Pancho, a Mexican store. That was like the only store there. Now there's like all kinds of doggy stores, ice cream shops, and all those stuff. That's a great example. I hope you do because I'd want to read about that from your perspective. <laughs> Linda, did you want to get in here? Yeah. You have to unmute. Do you see where to do that? Oh, click the mute on top, the microphone. Uh, there you go. Good. Lost it again. Yep. <laughs> Try it one more time. Um, Miguel, I was wondering if you could say more about you know relating to it based on your friend moving away. Why did your friend have to move away? Why did he move to the uh, Salem? Uh, his um, landlord. He was renting a house, so then his landlord, I think, ended up selling it and kicked them out, and they couldn't find nowhere else to live. And I'm guessing it's it's becoming like an apartment building with like shops at the bottom of it and yeah he, that, Salem was the only way only place he could actually go how far is Salem from you um pretty far it's 60 it's like, minutes yeah an hour away yeah. so, so you don't get to see him as much anymore no he, he was my friend was uh, my fifth grade friend Right, Isaiah. How about you? Can you hear us right now? I can't hear you. <laughs> Isaiah okay. is persistent. I gotta say, yeah. he's not giving up. <laughs> <laughs> One second. There we, there we go. go. We hear you. Oh. We're good. Okay, you hear me now? Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Hey, so okay. we just we're talking about the snapshot writings, and I asked. Miguel and Austin, if there was one that stood out to you the most, or one that you think you might want to write some more about, if you could tell us about that. Uh, uh, I think it would have to be about uh, last Thursday when we were talking about uh, when we wrote about our last Thursday uh, basically. Um, I had a pretty memorable time. It was. This summer, August, this Thursday of August, and basically I went there with a group of friends, and you know, went there. I saw old friends. I saw you know, family, a bunch of people there, and um, it's just you know one of those moments where you know you're hanging out with your friends, and you don't want that moment to end. You know, that type mm -hmm. of. Moment. But, uh, That's great. You know, it was one of those like you know we're just chilling, and then, you know, my 
friend had this crush on this girl, and like he couldn't get over her, and it was, you know, we all stuff to laugh about and something to joke about, and, you know, we all had fun. <laughs> well, that snapshot of last Thursday, like one one of the things I really love to bring it back to the book. Um, it's a pretty pivotal event in the context of the story. I'm not going to spoil it because I know Austin's on chapter 36 right now. Um, but it, again, it talks about that complexity of what that event means for different people and uh, kind of like what Renee, Renee was saying too, like the larger national conversation about what Portland is. Um, it, there, there's not just one story about what this place is and what these mm -hmm. events are for people. So I think that's a great connecting point too. I also want to go back to the Mary Isaiah, Anderson. I went, hi, this is Ms. Christensen. I was wondering um, how you feel about about last Thursday and all the shops on, on Alberta Avenue. Like, um, when you think about the characters, are you more like Maya and resistant to it, or are you more like, oh, what was, what's her sister's Nikki. name? Nikki. Nikki, and kind of into the scene there. Um, well, I'm a very adaptive and high tolerant person, so I'm more like <laughs> I'm more like Nikki. Nikki, so you know I can, you know I'm used to change. Okay, that's a great question. I like to. Yeah. Renee, you wanted to say something. Oh, I was just gonna say, you know, we were talking earlier about well, what if you don't live in an urban environment, or maybe what if you're teaching in a school and there's not a lot of diversity, and I just. I want to. I've said this a lot in different forums, and it's it's not my statement, um, but I think that it's important that teachers have books that are windows and mirrors for their students, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are times when we want our students to absolutely relate to what they're reading, and then there are times when it's I think good for them to have to read about another world or another experience. And so. I, and I also think by doing that, you realize that, oh, I do have a lot of things in common, even though that's not my exact story. Some of the themes about friendship, what it means to be loyal to your community, to your family, um, and how do you cope with change as a young person in general, I think are some common themes that young people deal with regardless of where they live. And so I think it's important for educators to put, continue to put before young people many different stories from many different voices so that they are well rounded and that they can practice the muscle of empathy and think about what it might be like to live in that situation if, if that's not their situation. I love that you said um, practice the uh, muscle of empathy. You know, it's something that as educators we have to encourage and and teach. And I think that Renee, your book next year, um, I'm going to give it to our English teacher. I mean, we teach teach humanities, and the students have a choice to read one of several different um, books from the perspective of someone who's different from them, uh, from the perspective of a different race. And I think that this book could be really influential in that unit. Thank you. I'm wondering, since we have three, uh, well, three young men on, mm -hmm. and this is a book uh, yeah. that is from the point of view of, of a young woman, that one of the things that was brought up this summer was, well, you know, it seems like it's a really good book, but we don't know if the males will buy in. And so how would you answer that? Um, oh, um, oh um, I really liked the book. Like, it was easy to adapt to, and I could relate to a lot of stuff that's go going on in the book. So, and it's like it's very fast paced. So it's like I was able to catch up and stay with it. Like it's it's interesting. So it makes you want to read it more. That's a great answer. Right, um, I'm saying. I mean. To piggyback a little bit off of what Austin said, uh, it's like basically it's the fact that it is a good book and you know they can actually be switched up. Like you know, it could be three boys having you know being fun and you know uh, one dude having to switch up and change. You know, they're dating three hot girls, I guess. You know, um, <laughs> but uh, basically, you know, it's. It's easy for uh, either gender to read. Uh, for either gender to read, there are books you know that are specifically for a certain gender, but this is actually a good book for both genders to read. Great book. Oh, thank you. <laughs>
Miguel, you want to answer that one too? Uh, no, I'm pretty sure Isaiah. I was about to say the same thing. Any anyone could relate to it. It could be a boy side of you or a girl side of you. Well, I haven't. Oh, is it okay if I jump in with another question? I have a question because I think one of the things that's really interesting about the book is the whole idea of interracial dating, which you know, at Jefferson, having been at Jefferson for about forty years, has been a like sometimes a tension point. Like, well. Are you going to date somebody outside of your race? So what do you guys think about that and the, how Renee deals with that in the book? Well, I, I'm not full black or full white, so I can relate to it. And for me, interracial dating is okay. But I guess for most people it wouldn't be like that. But I, don't, I think it's okay to go and do what you like and not have to worry about what everybody else has to say because it's affecting you. But, yeah. Can I say or something? I'll follow up. Austin, can I ask you to follow up? What, what do you mean you're not for black and not for white? I mean, I'm not oh. full black or full white. I'm not full. I didn't hear you. Oh, gotcha. So um, how, how do you describe yourself? Uh, just... Mix black, white, native, and Hawaiian. Okay. Isaiah, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it's just, I mean, in this area, it's not that weird for us to church now. I realize that it was, you know, a big thing back then. But, like, I mean, it's more of like a family thing, you know what I'm saying? More like a what your parents think. You know, they are, my parents are calling me dating white women, you know, they just rather date a black girl, you know what I'm saying? It's, you know, more expected of me to date a black girl than it is to white Yeah. Miguel, what about you? Um, I really didn't hear the question. Yeah, do you want to... What the question was talking about, I don't know where you are in the book right now, so I, I wanted to be sensitive about that. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, but as Maya and Tony's relationship is developing, um, Ms. Christensen was asking about how interracial relationships are portrayed in the book, how they show up at Jefferson. And how do you personally feel about that, about interracial dating? Um, I don't think it really matters. Um, it's sort of like what Isaiah said. My, my mom wants me to date an Hispanic girl, but I don't think she would really care if I date anyone else. Like, it wouldn't really matter. Have you gotten to that part in the book where my Tony starts to realize? No. Okay. I'm on chapter, like, 18. Okay. Well, it's pretty good when it comes up. <laughs> <laughs> you have a surprise waiting for you. <laughs> you know, I think I, I love... Thank you for asking that, Linda. I, I wanted to also, you know, mess with family tradition, cultural expectations, and then trying to come to terms with following your own heart. And sometimes your own self is in conflict with itself, right? So thinking about, I, I mean, I, I think it happens a lot when you're in, in your adolescence, but even as an adult, there's just some things that you think, my life is supposed to be this way. This was my dream. This is my goal. Or this is what I've been taught. This is what the normal thing is in my community. So to break away from that or deviate and do something different can be really hard. And um, Maya has to kind of struggle with that inwardly about is it disloyal to do something against the grain of what your friends are doing? Um, how can you be your true self but still have pride in who you are? And so I love that uh, schools are having those discussions with, with students. You know, um, I, one of the workshops you did at a library in Portland was called uh, Celebrating and Critiquing Home. Yes. So do you want to talk, I mean, I, I think you have hit on some of the themes already, but not specifically mentioning home. Like, and home is in the title of the novel, too. Do you want to talk a little bit about home and 
expand on this, this theme a little bit of critiquing and celebrating? I mean, that, that's hard to do both of those things. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of times we tend to do one extreme. So we either really praise something and ignore the flaws, or we only complain about the things we don't like and don't recognize the things that maybe we should be grateful for. And so I've been, um, as I'm on book tour, I've been doing workshops with, with community members, young people, libraries at schools, I'm asking them to think about places they love and then kind of talk about um, what you love about it, and but also what you would change about it and what's what are the things that um, don't bring you joy, right? So I use Margaret Walker's um, Sorrow Home, and she's a poet who grew up in the South and moved to the North. And in moving to the North, when she got up there, thinking, you know, I left the South, I left lynching, I left all these, you know, sad memories. She gets up north and is like, um, I miss the south. I, I miss um, land. I miss um, cotton fields, actually. I actually miss home. And so that's a complicated thing for a black person who grew up in an era where the south was a dangerous place to leave it, but to also miss it. It was an interesting thing for me to, to read in her work. And so I'm just having young people think about what are the things that you want to celebrate and honor about the places that you're from, and what are some things that you want to critique. And, the, and giving young people permission to do both, I think, is important. Um, and that's what I do in a lot of my writing, is thinking about the bitter and the sweet and kind of mixing that together in stories and having them right up next to each other. Because I think that's the reality. More than not, it's bitter and sweet at the same exact time, and not always all sweet or all bitter. I wanted to circle back to Isaiah for a second and mention that that you were talking about wanting to write about an experience that where you you were hanging out with your friends, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I basically turned all my writings, or most of my writings, into songs. Where you know what? We're we're getting you uh, your talk right into the mic if you, wherever your mic is. I, don't know. I basically turn most of the writing that I make into a song. All right. I love that. Yeah. Can you give an example? What do you mean? Um. Well, right now I'm working on a song about meeting a girl and you know feeling a certain type of way and knowing that you know. That could be the right one, you know. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, I know a lot of you know, parents will give me a lot of help. Relationships, everything. <laughs> but um, uh, I've got you know, the first, the first, and half the first. You know, I've just just nonstop been working on it. Just, yeah. Whatever, whatever's still in my mind, I just write. I just write about it. So, and, and what I wanted to ask you is that um, the curriculum and some of the approach of your teachers and in, in, um, in Renee's book also, um, you know, there, there's a political frame, right? Um, but when you talk about just writing about what you really want to write about, just do politics come up? Do you notice that them coming up or, or does that matter? Um, actually, a lot of it, it, a lot of it has came up like in the past few months, actually. Um, yeah, just basically, I mean, ever since the uh, whole Mike Brown incident, actually, you know, it's been a lot like my music has been more wrapped around the political views and you know what the society has actually done. Fair enough. So we're, we're pushing into the last 10 minutes here, so I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to bring up issues that they want to bring up. But um, as we go here, Miguel, anything on your mind that you'd like us to talk about? Like, what are you, what are you writing about? What are you thinking about? Um, just about Alberta, how I lived there for, like, mostly my whole life, and it's changed. Like it's safer to walk around, but 
there's there's a big difference than when I was little. There used to be all kinds of stuff I used to like there. Now I rarely visit there because I I'm guessing all the stuff there is too expensive, and I just I just don't like the change. But you still live there. No, I moved like three years ago. I see. Where, is there another part of town that you hang out in now? Like you said, you used to hang out on Alberta. Where do you hang out now? Um, like around, you know, I don't know what the street is called, like right across from Vancouver Avenue. Like Wil Williams, that? Yeah, um, I sort of hang around there. Like they have like this good Mexican food, but that's pretty much it. And I like, I like the... Well, uh, how would you say it? How would you say that? Uh, just like a natural it. feel. Like it just works. trees, houses. Yeah. I would rather hang out there than like than where the shops are. Over. And, yeah. I'm saying like the lifestyle or like the <laughs> less businessy and more residential, more mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, like a park. Cool. Miguel, where did your family move to? Um, it's like Vancouver Avenue. It's okay. like it's like a block away from Humboldt. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So Miguel, are you writing about this? Do you write about how you're feeling about moving and how you're feeling about the changes that have happened? Yeah. Um, if Mr. Kulak makes us write about it. <laughs> I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure I'll write about it. <laughs> you know that's coming. <laughs> well, I would love to read some. So, I'll, Mr. Kulak has my information. So maybe you can send me some of your poems or an essay that you write. I'd love to hear. It. All right. Read it. I will. Great. Andy. Yes. Your, your thoughts. I mean, one of the things that you said very quickly earlier is, is and I, we kind of rushed over it, but it's worth noting that you did a lot of this curriculum yourself in the summertime before you brought it to your students. Um, I was thinking about it. I wasn't part of that group this summer with the okay. Oregon Writing Project. I went through before, but okay. one of my colleagues did, so I get the, the straight line from him. <laughs> and then one thing we did was set up a Google Drive folder so all the teachers that are teaching Renee's book are dumping in ideas that they have for something that got kids really excited in class that we can start developing more. Um, and that's, it's just been great. Like, uh, I mean, we've taught um, three other texts this year so far, and this one has had me as a teacher the most excited because there's so many things that are coming up and there's so many different um, ideas that are coming up in class that are going to turn into some really powerful writing that we will definitely share with you, Renee. Um, so I just, I mean, it's, it's a hit. And I knew when, when Linda um, mentioned that Renee's book was coming out that it was going to be a hit this year. And, and I'm just really glad to be in the midst of teaching it right now. In, in emails to me, I'm, there are no seniors here, but you also teach seniors in a in something called an inquiry class. Can you, and we're right at the end, but can you briefly characterize that class and what sure. students are doing there? Um, senior inquiry is uh, English, government economics, and it's part of the university studies program at Portland State University. So students earn 15 college credits um, after completing the coursework. And it's team taught. There's about 50 students in the room. Um, so I teach the English part, and my colleague, Wendy Shelton, teaches the government economics aspect. Mm -hmm. But really, it's, it's interdisciplinary, and, and we're team teaching every lesson together, um, regardless of our, our specified discipline. And uh, the um, class itself, like inquiry model, kids are doing a lot of investigation of what's going on in the world around them, similar to um, what my sophomores are doing. Uh, but there's more of a research component I involved in that class. Um, they've seen, there's several of them are reading the book right now, actually, and I know that they're going to insist that we read it as a class because a lot of the class is centered around discussion. And they, we've been talking about gentrification because they did a unit uh, junior year, so they know that um, being able to talk about the issues that are really affecting them through uh, a piece of fiction um, is just, it's a really great place to uh, unearth some things that they're thinking about that they're not sure how to really get at. That's my brief description. Yeah, that, that, that was useful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. that's, that's good to know. So some of the students who are here tonight are going to eventually be in that 
in that class, which is oh, great. Uh, all three of these young men will be there, that's for sure. That's cool. <laughs> That's cool. So we're, 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 we'd like to hear kind of last thoughts, um, and we'd love to hear from the students again, just like what your thoughts are, what you're thinking about here. Austin, do you want to kick that off? Uh, my thoughts on the book? Or anything. <laughs> yeah, you can make a prediction, too, what you think might happen. Oh, well, <laughs> from far I'm reading... I can see a lot's already evolving in the book, but I can see that they're going, Tony and Maya is already starting to get an intense relationship, and everything's pretty much working out the way Maya wasn't expecting it to happen. So she sort of has to adapt to the surroundings now. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for coming tonight. What was this like for you, talking to all of us? I, it was okay because I talked to – on Fridays we have a group discussion and sometimes I'm in the middle talking with people th to the whole class and stuff, so it's nothing out of the ordinary. Cool. That just made my night. Thanks, Austin. <laughs> Isaiah, your final thoughts here tonight. Okay, great. I mean, the book. Uh, <laughs> it's relatable. Did you get out? It's a, it's a very nice book, and it's relatable. Okay. Cool. Great. Andy, final thoughts? Final thoughts. Um, I, I guess just grateful and excited, and, and I mean, I, I was really glad to be a part of this conversation. Any chance to talk with students and Linda and Renee meet new educators out there that are, are doing great work. Um, I just, it's very fulfilling. I was very nervous coming into this. I've never done something like this either. Um, <laughs> so at like three in the morning I'm tossing and turning just like wondering what it was going to be like. But it was actually, it was very enjoyable. So uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Well we'll have to have you all back again other times too. But, sure. Uh, Linda, sure. your thoughts. You have to unmute Linda. Yeah, so, I think I'm unmuted now. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Click that. Yeah, there we go. There okay, we go. Um, my my ending thoughts are: this is delightful, and I think that it's the way that um, education should look. That we have writers and teachers and um, and uh, you know students together collectively discussing um, important issues that matter in their lives and through fiction. And, um, and writing about that. And so thank you for gathering us together, Paul. Marianne. Um, I feel really grateful. Um, it was really an absolute pleasure to hear from um, Austin, Isaiah, and Miguel. Um, I think it's really cool that you guys um, had the opportunity to to teach us about the book and give us your insight. Um, and I'm also really grateful for um, the guidance that Renee has given me, and it's really wonderful to finally see your face, even if we haven't met. And um, I use Linda and Bill stuff in my classroom all the time, so I'm like over the moon right now. This has been absolutely wonderful, so thanks. Well, thank you for keeping to reach for reaching out so much, and uh, yeah, we'll keep you connected. Miguel, you you have some great stories you've been telling tonight. Uh, I hope you do some writing about them. Any any thoughts here as we're closing? The uh, uh, I just really like the book, but Austin just spoiled the, that Tony and <laughs> <laughs> and Mary are gonna. Hate it. Intense relationship. <laughs> I can't wait to read the book. It's just one big soap opera. I gotta tell you. <laughs> nah. Anyway. Okay. Cool. Renee, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me into the conversation and for featuring my book. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, it's cool. Um, and and I wanted to mention that when you go to Ren, um, what's your website again? The it has the photographs. Reneewatson.net. Right, there are photographs of of wonderful places outside of Portland too. You know, so that 
it's interesting that you, you know, you, you're, you're a very local girl, but you have other things going on, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. I am a local I'm a Portland girl, for real, at heart. But, yeah, I, I like to write about place in general, the places that I travel and all the many places that I call home. Um, and I, I, I will close with saying, you know, it's an honor to talk with young people who are reading the work, and it's an honor to talk to a teacher who taught me to write. Um, so I, I want to just put out there, I know it's cliche, but teachers, you know, we have the power to fan the flame. I was writing this story when I was 16, 17 years old, and because a teacher took me seriously and told me to keep going, I believed that I could be a writer one day. So I just want us to be mindful as educators of being able to really inspire a young person to grow up and then fulfill their dream. And then young people who are listening and thinking about taking yourself serious, even if it's not writing, whatever it is that you do, like Isaiah, you're a, you're a singer, you're a musician, you know, and you are one now. You don't have to say, I want to be one. The fact that you're at a studio and you're at SEI, which I used to work for SEI, um, you know, I think taking yourself seriously is important. And I just want to leave that out there, that um, hold on to the things that you're creating now because it's important to you, and you might be able to use that one day and share it with a larger audience. Well, thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, we're here every Wednesday, 6 o'clock uh, there, out there on the West Coast, um, and 9 o'clock here on the East Coast. And um, we um, are a we broadcast as a channel of the World Bridges Network, um, edtechtalk.com. And uh, Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier set that up. Uh, many years ago. This was show 431, believe it or not, folks. But thank you all, and uh, we'll talk to you all again soon. Good night. 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 Good night.